This is what I know, that strength is available. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or, or think. The book of Hebrews. This is the second installation, four-part series, Give and Receive Love. We have already started our time in this series last week taking a look at giving and receiving love from John's gospel account in John chapter 13. Today we're taking a look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24. The series outline has 24. I'm going to add 25 as well. If you don't mind, I'll read both of those. When you're there, say amen. If you're at home watching, just have to take it for granted that you are you're there as well. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 and 25 reads as follows. The writer there says, and let us consider how to stimulate One another to love good deeds. Some translations may have provoke. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, for some had already stopped coming and assembling. The contrast is, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I want to talk about today giving others love through considering, giving others love through considering or consideration. Let's pray all wise and eternal God, thank you for today and this opportunity to share with the saints of God and all who are present, all who are watching. We thank you, dear God, for, as we mentioned previously, the strength to stand here, but also the strength to preach and to share this word that you have given us. May we do this, dear God, with the mindset of knowing what we read this morning, that it is not by eloquence of speech or the wisdom of men. It is by the preaching of the gospel that men might be saved. We thank you, dear God, for giving us that reminder on today. May we lean into the spirit and the power that he provides, that there might be a demonstration of your power and not our own. It's in Christ Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Bertha Sanderson hadn't been to church in five years when she decided to give church another try. Instead of going to a regular church, she decided to visit another church in her community that promoted a good worship experience, vibrant Christian education ministry, active Christian ministry for all ages, consistent in evangelism and Christian mission through the sharing of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, locally, regionally, and globally. When Bertha walked into the church, someone greeted her and offered to assist her in any way that she needed. Bertha didn't know any other church members or anybody that was there that was her first time visiting. And as she stood on the aisle looking for a place to sit down to worship, 
John and Carol Simpson walked in, and Carol noticed that Bertha looked indecisive. And so she welcomed Bertha to the church, and she welcomed Bertha to sit down with uh, herself and her husband. From beginning to end, Bertha enjoyed every aspect of the worship experience, and after service, Carol offered Bertha an opportunity to go to lunch with she and her husband. Bertha enjoyed talking and sharing with Carol and John. When Carol asked Bertha how she ended up at St. Thomas Baptist Church, Bertha dropped her head and paused for several seconds. And Bertha finally responded. As she lifted her head, she said, don't get me wrong, I love my home church but it has its share of problems. The last time I was there, one of the church leaders scolded me for not being at Sunday school. I told her, Bertha said, I work at night and I work the night shift and I don't get off until the early morning hours and I barely even make it to work, to, to morning worship on time. But the lady didn't want to listen to me. She didn't even have any compassion on me at all. Bertha told Carol and John, I left church that Sunday feeling heartbroken. And that Sunday was my last Sunday of going to church for over the past five years. Carol grabbed Bertha by the hand and she said, Bertha, I know I just met you. She said, but I need to share something with you that I think will really bless you. Carol said, Bertha, the church that you attended today and the church that I feel as though you really enjoyed, as you have shared with me your enjoyment of, of St. Thomas Baptist Church. She said, I need to let you know that this church that you enjoyed so much, it too has its share of problems. Bertha nodded her head as Carol kept talking. Carol said, it has its share of problems, but one of the things I love about it is the amount of love that's in our church and how we go out of our way to consider one another just like I'm doing for you today. Three weeks later, Bertha joined St. Thomas Baptist Church and found several places, opportunities to serve and use her spiritual gifts, and after about three months of faithfully attending and serving, just like Carol shared with her, Bertha began to see that there were problems at St. Thomas Baptist Church, but what Bertha remembered was what Carol told her. It was the loving relationships that they had in the church, and Bertha leaned into that, and whenever a problem came up, she worked through those loving relationships to work those problems out. And when somebody came to her with a problem about someone else, she used that same love to help that person to work through the problems that they had in the church. One year after being at St. Thomas Baptist Church, Bertha saw one of the church members from a former church. Rita Howard greeted Bertha and told her how much she missed her at New Light Baptist Church. Bertha asked, Rita, so how are things at New Light? Rita said, girl, I haven't been to New Light in a long time. Why, Bertha asked. Rita said, to be honest with you, I hadn't been to anybody's church in the past four years. Bertha said, Rita, I felt the same way you did until I started attending St. Thomas Baptist Church. Rita pointed her finger in Bertha's face, and she said, I don't care to hear anything about anybody's church. She said, I don't want to go to church, and I don't want you talking to me about church. Bertha paused, and she kept listening to Rita as Rita kept talking, and Rita said, let me tell you something, Bertha. I don't want anything to do with church. And I don't want to be caught in anybody's church. Because it ain't nothing at church but a bunch of hypocrites, liars, backbiters, gossipers, adulterers, homosexuals, fornicators, drunks, thieves, and alcoholics. Bertha, listen. 
Let Rita finish. She said, Rita, I hate you had a terrible experience at New Light. I had an unpleasant experience at New Light as well. She said, but I have a different perspective about church today, Rita. Bertha said, Rita, have you been to Walmart lately? Yes, I went yesterday. What's the point? Bertha said, Rita, before you went in to Walmart, did you stop and consider were there any hypocrites, liars, backbiters, gossipers, adulterers, fornicators, thieves, homosexuals at Walmart? Rita said, no, I didn't. But what's the point? Bertha said, Rita, it's good news to know that those people are attending churches every Sunday because it gives them an opportunity, just like you and me, to hear the gospel and the good news of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. She said, Rita, I was just like you. Before I joined St. Thomas, I was looking for a perfect church until I realized if I found one and joined it, I'd mess it up. Rita looked at Bertha and she agreed. She nodded her head and she said, Bertha, next time you get ready to go to church, will you please let me know because I think I want to attend with you. One of the things that I've learned about the New Testament church is that the New Testament never, the scripture never portrays the New Testament church as a perfect entity. The church in the New Testament was brought into existence by a perfect God who worked through a sinless Savior to build a church with flawed and defective believers who were made righteous by the righteousness of God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Someone listening to me right now may have had the wrong perspective about the New Testament church. Maybe I'm talking to someone today who has had a bad experience in church. Maybe you're listening or watching me right now, and you're that person who maybe had a bad experience at church or has the wrong perspective about church, and you're just like Rita. You're telling folk, I don't ever want to go to church, don't ever want to have anything to do with church because there's so many hypocrites, liars, backbiters, gossipers, adulterers, fornicators, homosexuals, alcoholics, and thieves at church. And my word to you today is you need to understand that the church is God's creation and process. The church is made up not of perfect people, but of imperfect human beings saved by God's grace washed in the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who need forgiveness every day of their lives because they keep messing up every day of their lives. And I'm lumped in. We need to know that church is made up of folk who know that they are not where they ought to be. But they are just coming each Sunday knowing that they may not be where they ought to be, but they sure thank God they're not where they used to be. I'm in that group. Church is not a place for perfect people. It's a place for those who are being perfected until the full glory of God shall be manifested in their lives. That's why I thank God for this text today. Book of Hebrews. These believers were thinking about giving up on church. They didn't have a building like what we have today, but they were gathering together. And some of them were thinking about not coming together. Matter of fact, some of them, as the writer says in the text, had already made that a practice in their life, and that is giving up on the assembled body, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. One of the reasons for that is because these were Hebrew Christians. They had given up Judaism to become Christians. And you know what that means? It cost them something to do that. Family members were now pressuring them to come back to Judaism. And initially, when they gave up Judaism to accept Christ, they, they endured the persecution joyfully. 
But after a while, their faith began to cool off. It had a cooling period. That flame that was there before began to flicker. And now some of them had stopped coming and assembling and some of them were thinking about going back to Judaism. And the writer in Hebrew says, don't you dare even consider not coming and assembling yourselves together because there are benefits of coming together. You're able to consider one another and bless one another and interact with one another. And that's what the text is telling us today as we get ready to lean into it. And that's how come I love this central idea today, giving others love through consideration. It's not easy, but giving others love through consideration is essential. It's not easy, as we will find out, and as we already know, if you didn't, considering other folk is not easy at all. But we need to get into this text and see what the writer is talking about. When we come and we assemble with one another, the writer says it's an opportunity to engage others and engage them with love. If you look at verse 24, the Hebrew writer said, and let us consider how to stimulate, how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. First time I read this text, I thought there were two commands within the verse. When I first read the text, I thought this word consider, thought this word stimulate, both were verbal commands. But, but what's going on here is, is that the verb consider is the command. Stimulate, that's the noun. And since that's the case, it means that this idea of stimulating is the result, it's the outcome of the verbal command to consider. If there's to be any motivation for love and good works, the writer says it's imperative that we first consider one another. The word consider means to give careful attention to the needs of others. Therefore, the Hebrew writer is saying today, if there's going to be a true Christian community that assembles together, overcomes obstacles, and, and is not self-centered, then you've got to be able to consider one another. And the writer says, when you consider one another, you'll be able to stir and provoke others. And when you are able to provoke and stir others, what's happening is, is that now, out of this priority to consider others, there's something on the other side of that. Love and good works. Love and good works are on the other side of considering others. This is not in the message, but I'm hearing the Spirit say, say this parenthetically, Trevor. Some of us are fearful of considering others in the way that we really need to because we live in a day and time that if you really do what the Bible is saying and you pay attention to others closely and consider their needs even before you consider your others, sometimes folks will call you nosy. That's a fear that some of us have. We don't want to get in nobody's business. We don't want to get outside of our lanes. But if you really want to consider somebody else, you got to step outside of yourself and you got to get in their business. You may have to have some hard conversations with them as you consider them to stir and provoke them to love. The first thing that they may do is put up a defense mechanism and say, I'm good. But you got to understand sometimes when folks say I'm good, what they're really saying behind and on the other side of I'm good is please help me. Yeah, they ain't good. They just want you to think they are. But I've learned, I've, I've been on the other side of too many of those to know you got to go on and press your way through that and help that person by considering them. Now, some folk don't ever make it to love and good works because they're not good at considering. I was reading the Daily Bread this week and some of you, last week, and some of y'all may have read this, December the 8th, 2021. I read a story about a church. It had a church fight. It had problems. And they didn't make it to love and good works, I promise you. The story goes that in the 1800s, at a potluck dinner at Dewberry Baptist Church, two men got to fighting. Guess what they were fighting over? The last drumstick. 
One man said, God wants me to have the drumstick. The other man said, uh-uh. God wants me to have the drumstick. It became so contentious that one of the men left the church, went down the road almost a mile and a half, and started Dewberry Baptist Church number two. I was curious. I went online, and I found Dewberry Baptist Church. And I found Dewberry Baptist Church number two. This actually could have happened. I know the churches are existing. I don't know if the story is actually factual or not, but that, that's not what's important. What's important is, is that they will not consider one another. And some of the church splits that we've seen over the years is because people would not consider one another. There should never be a time that Trinity ever has to split. Now it came out of split. It split again, and it split again, and it split again. And some of that is because in, in between there, there was a problem in consideration, and we didn't get the love and good works. But I promise you this, as pastor of Trinity Missionary Baptist Church, I would do everything I can to make sure that we consider one another. You can call me nosy if you want to. You can tell me you're good if you want to. But I'm going to consider you in order to stir and provoke love and good works in you. Ain't going to be no splits. Can you make a declaration on that today? No more splits. Number two, the writer says, when we come together, it's also an opportunity to not only engage one another and provoke and stir love, but it's also an opportunity to encourage someone. The writer in Hebrews says, if you look at verse number 25, he says on the back side of us, making sure we are assembled together, he just simply says, but encouraging one another. Contextually speaking, as I said before, these people were going through, being persecuted. Many of them were thinking about giving up, throwing in the towel, staying away from the public meeting. They needed a word of encouragement. Encouragement is still a great need in the 21st century church. Somebody got up this morning who's here today. You didn't feel like coming to church, but you're here. Some of you realize that if I can just make it to church, I might just hear a word of encouragement. If I could just make it to church, I might be able to talk to somebody who has similar troubles. If I can just make it to church, I might talk to somebody who has a similar testimony. I might be able to hear a word of teaching or a word of preaching that helps me just to go, not another day, another hour. You do know that there's some folk who show up here on Sunday morning and they contemplated taking their lives. But a word of encouragement helped them to know that it's, it's worth living. It's worth living. That's what we need. Encouragement is powerful. The artist Benjamin West tells how he became a successful and important painter. When he was young, he said his mother went out and left him in charge of his sister Sally. And in the meantime, Benjamin discovered bottles, colored ink, and began to do Sally's portrait. A big mess developed, because he wasn't a great painter then. Finally, when Ben's mother came home and saw the tragic mess, she didn't say nothing. She just picked up the paper portrait of Sally. Sally and said, why, it's Sally. And she kissed Ben. And ever since that day, Wes has said, my mother's kiss, I quote, made me a painter, end quote. I don't know how you feel about it, but I just believe that there's someone whose life is in a mess. And they need a word of encouragement. Somebody today needs to be encouraged that you can get out of debt. You don't have to stay in debt. 
You can get out of debt. Somebody needs to be encouraged today. You don't have to live in addiction. I got out of addiction. You can get out of addiction. Somebody needs to know today, you don't have to live by the pool of the flesh. I'm not yielding my body to the flesh. You don't have to yield your body to the flesh. Somebody needs to know today, you can get out of that adulterous relationship. You don't have to keep doing that. Somebody needs to know today, you can be encouraged. I used to be a fornicator, but you don't have to keep being a fornicator. I used to be known as a liar, but you don't have to be a liar. I used to have to steal to get what I needed this day, but I don't steal no more, and you don't have to steal either. I used to be a street pharmacist, but I'm not a street pharmacist now. I go to work and I pay my bills legitimately, not looking out of the window over my shoulder, and neither do you have to. I used to be an alcoholic. Thought I had to drink down to the bottom of the bottle, but I don't have to drink anymore. I got another spirit. You do know when you go to restaurants, you do know when you pass by liquor stores, you'll see a word that says spirits. If you drink it, it will give you a spirit. Matter of fact, it's a spirit that'll make your tongue get loose and say some things that you normally wouldn't say. But I don't want that spirit. I want the spirit that Paul talked about. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18 where he says, be controlled by the spirit. Yeah, when you're controlled by the Spirit, you get the fruit of the Spirit. You get love. You get joy. Talk to me, somebody. That's what I used to be. And there's somebody here today, you need that word of encouragement. Because you've been thinking you've got to do that. But the word of God is encouraging you today to know you don't have to. And I'm just considering others. And I hope that you're willing to do the same. It's not easy. Because when you consider others sometimes and you go to encourage them and you tell them you don't have to do that, the first thing they're going to say to you is what you did. Did you hear that? You did. That's good news. Start from right there. You're talking about what I used to do. They didn't say what you're doing. They said, but you did. I know that. And I'm not proud of it. But that's what I did. And that's where you need to get to, to a point that you can say, that's what I did. But this is what I'm doing. Last thing I'm done. It's an opportunity when we come together to encourage, bag up, to engage one another with love. But then the writer says, we got a chance to lean into expectation with others who are waiting like us. Verse 25, the writer says, and I appreciate you all being patient. It's, it's, it's hard to even breathe at times uh, with this sinus trouble I'm having today, but thank you for your patience. All the more as you see the day approaching or drawing near, contextually speaking, no matter how severe the trial of these believers, no matter how severe what they had to endure, they could rely on one another for motivation for living the Christian life in the face of persecution, visible obstacles if they did something else. And that is wait together in a joyful, hopeful expectation of the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's in the text. I don't know if you know this or not, but Jesus is coming again. He said, watch, but you know not the hour when the Son of Man will come. He said, of that day and that hour, no man knoweth, not even the angels, neither the Son, only the Father. We may not know the exact day that he's coming. But this is what I want you to know. He's coming. And if you knew Jesus was coming right now, would you change how you love other people? It's not so much that he can come tomorrow. Guess when he can come? Right now. 
And if that be the case, we have to consider one another, to stir, to provoke one another to love and good works. It's not something that makes us comfortable when we have to love and it's not easy to consider and love others, but it's something that we must do, even though it's not easy and comfortable. If you're listening to me right now, you need to know that we are called, you are called, to come and gather with other baptized believers who have given their lives to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You need to remember that when we come together, we must do our best to stir, to inspire one another to love and good works. Remember that when we come together, it's an opportunity to encourage one another as we jointly wait with great expectation on the Lord's second coming. Wow, you are inspiring me to love and do good works. I'll be inspiring you to do love and good works. While I'm encouraging you, then you can also be encouraging me. And while we're encouraging one another, somebody else can be encouraging someone else and someone else can be encouraging someone else. It should never be a day in the body of Christ. You hear me, Trinity? When somebody comes here and they feel like they have come and left unencouraged. Mm-mm. When we come together, we're not coming together to spend time with people who are perfect. We're coming together to spend time with people who are just like us. We're coming together to spend time with people who have their fair share of flaws, imperfections, shortcomings, mess-ups, failures, troubles, trials, tribulations, and turmoils. When we come together, we're coming to spend time with other folk who are struggling just like us. If you're here today and you're not struggling, maybe you're not trying to go where the rest of us are trying to go. Because if you're trying to go where we're trying to go, then on your way home to glory, the devil will make sure you have your share of troubles. And when the devil has done his job, there's also God you got to think about. Because on your way to glory, if it's not the devil, the Lord will make sure that you do not forget that the only reason why you have a heavenly home is because of him. On your way to glory, God can make sure that you never forget that it's because of him that you have the job you have. On your way home to glory, God can make sure that you never forget the reason why you're driving what you're driving is because of me. On your way home to glory, the Lord can make sure that the reason why you have, that you know the reason why you have a roof over your head is because of him. I'm saying that because sometimes, as I said before, you remember what I opened with? I opened with Job. Job was blessed by God. But when you get to chapter 42, Job is apologizing. He's apologizing because on his way home to glory, God had to remind him the reason, Job, why you have what you have. And the reason why you can be who you are, it is because of me. We're no better than the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, God's own son, whom he allowed to suffer, whom he allowed to go to a hill called Calvary, be whipped and beat all night long, be hung on an old rugged cross, hung wide, hung high, and stretched wide between heaven and earth. It was God's son that died on the cross. And while he died, we were still in our sins. But thank God, he gave up the ghost, was buried in a borrowed tomb, and the good news story is early Sunday morning, he got up from the grave. Not in sin now. And because we've been brought out of sin and into this body of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because he lived, that's the song we sing, 
Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, I can provoke you to love and good works. Because he lives, I can encourage you. Because he lives, we can wait expectantly together for the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I told you his power is available. See that? I ain't know whether I'd be able to preach today. But look at that. I told David about this the other week. I've been here before, and I know what to do, and that's lean on the power of the living God, and here, make sure you make it through. Anybody else here ever had to lean on that power? Anybody else here had to lean on that power? Doors of the church are open by letter of baptism, Christian experience. The invitation is being extended to you today to come, whether in-house, whether virtually, that invitation is extended to you on today. Word of God has been preached. It has been preached. Some of this we already knew, some of it we may not have known. But for what we do know now, God is going to hold us accountable for this. Make your focus that of considering others. I'm just going to mind my own business. That's not, it's not a good member of the body of Christ. You got to take care of your business. But sometimes other folks' business has to become your business. And they may not want you to get in their business, I said earlier, but you have to. Press your way in at times. You'll know where. Do like I, I've shared for many years. Get your lights. See if God has given you a green light. Don't just barge in without being sensitive to the Holy Spirit as you're considering others. See if God has given you a green light to go on and proceed. Yellow light, proceed with caution or red light. It ain't time. 